Thank you, Rick. It is delightful to be in this wonderful place with you to talk about the myth of Alzheimer's and other powerful brain stories. In short, this is the story of a scientist who discovers a brain nucleus, develops some drugs, and then learns, as Rick said, there is more to the story, and it is story. Let's begin the story at the beginning, which is uh, my belief that I was a scientist before I could talk. I think uh, the curiosity about the world around us, the sense of uh, experimentation, hey, if I smile, what happens in the universe, starts with us as children. I don't think that's just me. I think that's all of us. I think we all have this sense of wonder. That's an expression I'll use and return to in this talk, a sense of wonder about the world around us. But there is more to my story because I advanced from a, an amateur storyteller to um, uh, 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 amateur scientist and storyteller to a professional um, scientist, if you will. So I got my PhD in um, psycholinguistics, and I become fascinated with words and their power over people. The sense of wonder, what do those words mean? Images um, and, and the like. However, my career moved from the psychology, if you will, to being a neurologist, as, uh, as you heard, and studying the brain. And ironically, as someone who was interested in words, the structure that I first studied was the substantia innominata. Now, you don't have to know too much Greek and Latin to appreciate that that means something about an unnamed substance. Who could have imagined there was something left in the brain that was unnamed? Some of you may have heard of the substantia nigra. That's the black substance that's affected in Parkinson's. And there's the red nucleus and the blue nucleus. Uh, so maybe the problem is it's unnamed because they ran out of colors. <laughs> it's also located so deep in the brain, it's kind of at the bottom, and it's not a discrete cluster of nerve cells. It's kind of scattered around the place. So it's a nucleus uh, that uh, is a little bit mysterious. However, what we did was we studied this cluster of cells in people with Alzheimer's and people who did not have memory problems. And uh, th these are, this is my microscopic slide. At the top, you'll see a number of nerve cells uh, that are, in fact, the normal complement. And below, you'll see some rather uh, skinny cells, some cells that aren't, uh, if you're a pathologist, looking too healthy. That was what happened in our first person, that we two people that we studied, someone with Alzheimer's and someone without. We subsequently went on and studied this uh, substantia nominata and uh, learned that it was affected actually in Parkinson's disease and also to a certain extent in aging. So it wasn't a specific story to Alzheimer's. In modern times, the substantia nominata has gotten a name finally, and it's called the cholinergic basal forebrain. The basal forebrain, I think, is, uh, is apparent because it's in the base of the brain, a little bit up front. The cholinergic relates to what we've learned about the structure in terms of its neurotransmitter. It uses a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. That's how your brain works. <clears throat> and this particular neurotransmitter is uh, shown here in this image, and it is released between nerve cells so nerve cells can talk to each other. It's all about communicating, even at the level of brain function. What was interesting about this uh, neurotransmitter, it, is, is it was affected in Alzheimer's disease. So we developed, and of course, a team, a series of medications, which are the most widely used medications to treat people with Alzheimer's, based on an inhibition of an enzyme called an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor enzyme. The details don't matter. The idea was that the brain findings helped us find medications that we thought might help people. And so they were approved by the Food and Drug Administration and other places around the world. Unfortunately, I have to say, they were not as effective with, as we hoped they would be. They didn't really affect quality of life in the way we'd like. They improved memory a little bit, and that was important, perhaps, but they just weren't the whole um, answer. And in fact, there became more to this story again. And in this case, it was the connection between medications and money. Because uh, the pharmaceutical companies took these medications, and they sold us a story that I think is a little bit distorted. And part of the way that they sold this story is because of their relationships with physicians. Physicians get paid by drug companies to do all kinds of things, not the least of which is influence their opinion about medications. 
So my friend Carl Elliott wrote a book, uh, White Hoat, Coat, Black Hat, Adventures on the Dark Side of Medicine. Now, I could some, share some stories about that, but I really don't want to focus on the dark side. I want to bring us out in the light, because frankly, Alzheimer's disease is a very fearful condition. It's something that frightens people. And, and the phenomenology, the fact that older people do lose their memories, is uh, an undeniable fact. But there's more to my story. So what I did at Johns Hopkins before I moved to Case Western Reserve is I became a brain banker. Isn't that a funny word? I collected tissues donated by families and people affected by these brain conditions to support our research. And what we did when we collected these brains is we examined them. We examined the cholinergic basal forebrain. We examined the substantia nigra. We eva evaluated a number of different regions of the brain to try to understand what was happening in the brain. What we learned from that is that this process that we call Alzheimer's affected people in very different ways. The brain wasn't always the same. The amount of damage in one area varied in different people. And the genes varied. And the neurotransmitters varied. So in my opinion, we came to learn that Alzheimer's was not one particular condition. I learned this most powerfully from my patients. This uh, fellow is a professor of biochemistry in my own university. And he was amazing, because he gave me advice about what kinds of medications to develop. As a biochemist, he had some ideas about that. His wife was a psychologist, and she had all kinds of interesting ideas about herbs and, and other uh, things that she wanted to help her husband with. So it became an interesting conversation, as every relationship does with patients and their caregivers, around their individual story and how high is a healer could help them. So I eventually came to realize that I wanted to continue to be a brain banker, but I wanted to be a story banker. And so we published a little article in the Lancet, a medical journal, saying, I think it's really important that we collect stories, because it is the stories we tell here at TEDx and everywhere about our brain health, about our memories, that inspire us to help each other, that inspire us to understand just what's going on as we all age. So, I collected many stories and many words, and eventually, this is a wordle for those of you that don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a description of the words that appear in a certain place where the size of the word illustrates how often the word is used. That, obviously, is a book, something, having to, something to do with Alzheimer's and brain and disease. It, in fact, is associated with a book that we wrote called The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told About Today's Most Dreaded Diagnosis. Now, what aren't you being told? Well, I think I've shared with you the idea that Alzheimer's is not one thing. It affects people in very different ways. So the idea that there's one condition that we can fix with a single medicine is unfortunately, I'd love it to be true, <coughs> An easy fix is not likely. We also learned that Alzheimer's overlaps with other conditions, like Parkinson's disease. You can have a little bit of both. So conditions are not so separate from each other. The other thing we learned is that this involves all of us. This, these processes are related to brain aging. You guys haven't faced it in the audience here who are younger, but everybody here over the age of 30, 40, 50, knows their memory isn't quite as good as it used to be when they were younger. So there's something going on in all of us that makes us part of this myth of Alzheimer's, this need to rethink our brain aging. There's more to this story, though, and I said I wanted to try to make this a positive story, a story of community, a story of working together. So I want to share you with you now the work that we've done together with my wife, who's in the audience here, who's the principal of the Intergenerational School. This is a public school in Cleveland, Ohio, we've, where we come for, uh, to, to visit with you in your community. Uh, this is our community of lifelong learners. This is a public school where 224 children go to school with older people, with college students, with nursing students. And my wife is a fantastic principal, and this is the highest performing charter school in the state of Ohio. I think it's probably that way because my wife is the principal, but I also think it's that way because older people go to school with our children. I'm going to repeat our mission statement because every morning our students repeat the mission statement, and our students can be of various ages. The intergenerational school connects, creates, and guides a multi-generational community of lifelong learners and spirited citizens. 
those learners are of various ages. And in this image, there are people that have been labeled by doctors as having Alzheimer's disease. They contribute in that community. And in fact, we have data not only to demonstrate the value of the school to the kids, we've published data to show that people with memory problems who come to our school enjoy a higher quality of life, do better than those that stay in the nursing home and uh, talk to their peers. Not that there's anything wrong with talking to your peers, but this was a randomized control study. For those of you that know science, so that's a pretty uh, forceful form of evidence that allows us to say, we believe this school is a twofer. Valuable to the kids because the elders inspire them to be respectful, inspire them to know their history of their community, and also of uh, the, the elders allow, are allowed to see, and if you want to put it this way, a part of the future, because they can see the future through the eyes of the children. I want to tell you about one specific project, and this gets us to our sense of place. This is the Shaker Nature Center, uh, almost walking, is walking distance for the older kids from our school. And these are elders and, and, and students who are uh, uh, visiting the Nature Center, they're artists, they're scientists, they're recording notes, they're di making diagrams of what they're seeing in that natural environment. And what this particular group was doing was taking these notes and then made a multimedia production of what you see here in a few uh, sketches and images. And this is the entire group that you see uh, assembled on the main deck of the Nature Center. In this environment, we had people who had literally saved the Shaker Nature Center from being destroyed by a politician in 1962 who wanted to put a highway right through it. So when I say the kids can appreciate the value of their own community by understanding the need to be vigilant about keeping your community as you have heard stories already, they look like they're celebrating something, aren't, don't they? And in fact, they don't know it yet, historically, but they just won a prize. They won the Rachel Carson Sense of Wonder Prize offered by the Environmental Protection Agency for Multimedia Narrative. So this is an award our school got celebrating this mission statement that we have, bringing learners together in service of each other and to become spirited citizens. Now I want to tell you about one more award. The, the lady uh, is not featured in this picture, but she was our Volunteer of the Year Award. Now, in an intergenerational school, you'll imagine there are lots of people who might be eligible for a Volunteer of the Year Award. This person, while waiting to go up on the stage, turned to her family member and said, why am I getting the Volunteer of the Year Award? The family member said, well, because you come here every week and you volunteer in this school and the kids love you. And the woman turned to her family member and said, I do? She had enough memory problems, she couldn't remember that she came and volunteered in the school, and yet the kids loved her. So we have a place in our school for people with Alzheimer's disease, or what we used to call Alzheimer's disease. But there's more to your story. We are in such a fantastic place here that I wanted to celebrate Ked Katua and you all. And it's just amazing to be in a place where we're able to imagine things in ways that perhaps are a little harder to do unless you're surrounded by mountains and telescopes and the like. I started with an image of a child looking through a microscope. Let's end with a child looking through a telescope. Let's imagine our place in the universe. It's an amazing place, you have to admit. And I, I like to show this image because I think it's also important for scientists who think they can fix and understand everything even something like Alzheimer's, to have a sense of humility. And I think you see images of like this and you feel like you're a real human being as well as a scientist trying to understand very complex things. But you know, there's more to stories than even the universe. We can make up stories without borders. These are some kind of digital images. And I want to end by telling you what we're trying to do in Cleveland to spread our story uh, more widely than just there. So we have a school in virtual reality. We have an intergenerational school in a virtual reality space where this gentleman who actually is me, that's my avatar, Echo Wise, dressed in a kilt, 
goes around exploring environments that don't exist except in a computer and except in our own minds. And one of our collaborators, uh, Janaya, is here too to share her stories about this. We're also working with our university to connect our stories using broadband. We're part of the national effort to create connections between our schools and other institutions, and perhaps down here in North Carolina, because the Case Connection Zone does that. It uses very fast transmission, so we can spread our stories faster. So the book of life is full of wonderfully interesting stories. There are places for words, there are places for images, there are places for scientists, there are places for artists, there are places for kids, there are, patient, there are places for elders. And in this story, I think we keep need asking this question, why? Why are we alive? Why do we die? And there's only one why that differentiates your story from our story. So thank you for allowing us to be here in your community, sharing with you and also sharing through the TEDx process.